So, uh, Kavya and I welcome you to the second session of this Konya Specialty Day, and uh, we are very proud and privileged. We are proud and uh, privileged and honored to have amongst us the chairperson as Professor uh, Vanati Ma'am here from uh, RP Center, New Delhi, Ames, New Delhi, and uh, she will be. Uh, taking us through the keynote lecture on red signs in ocular surface disease. Uh, just a brief introduction about her. She is uh, a, a prolific surgeon and she's done her uh, post-graduation from Ames, New Delhi, and she's been super specialty trained in uh, from Singapore SNEC, and uh, she's done extensive work in the field of cornea as well as published postgraduate and undergraduate books on ophthalmology, she's authored many publications. It's, it's really our honor to have you with us today, ma'am. So if we can just request you to yeah. start the session and the co-chairperson will be Manisha, ma'am, from Shroff's. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Manisha Acharya. She's uh, the head of the Konya Services and the director of the Eye Bank at Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Manisha is a prolific academician with a keen interest in both ocular surface, corneal infections, multiple publications in both national and international journals. Uh, welcome, Dr. Manisha, as a chairperson for this session, and we look forward to an interesting one hour of all the conundrums of ocular surface disease. Thank you so much for your kind words, and it is indeed an honor to be among you all today in this very prestigious session. Thank you for the opportunity to be, to be presenting to you on uh, ocular surface diseases, the red flag science identification, management, and referral. I have no financial interest in the mention of uh, uh, any, uh, any of the products or uh, procedures during the course of this talk here. So when you look at ocular surface diseases, you can sort of broadly categorize them into inflammatory or infective lesions of the ocular surface. They could be due to cicatricial diseases, which could be like uh, due to OCP, due to SJS, or secondary to limbal stem cell deficiencies. They can primarily be because of malignancies, which you can be either uh, benign or malignant neoplasias here. Yeah? And of course, what you would commonly see is degenerative diseases affecting the ocular surfaces, the dry eye disease, and conjunctival degenerations. Largely, most of what we would encounter in our cornea practice would fall under any of these categorizations. And I have specifically not, not placed trauma under this, because trauma is something which is acute and you would immediately interfere uh, for its management here. So what are the red flag signs in identifying these? I have targeted this largely towards the theme of today's session being uh, aimed towards comprehensive ophthalmologists here. So most of us would be seeing in our practice uh, patients who are on contact lens wear here, especially as cornea specialists here. So contact lens associated red eye is something which we need to pick up early. And when we look at Claire, which is contact lens associated red eye, you'll need to differentiate whether it's because of an immune disease or because of it's, is it because of an infective disease. So that would be primarily one when you look at click contact lens induced keratitis, you'll have to know whether it is an infectious or an immune keratitis. So the signs here largely when you look at immune keratitis, usually not associated with pain in the beginning, the lesions might be unifocal or multifocal and are peripheral here. And when you have an, a large amount of associated inflammatory signs of blepharospasm, more of, con, of conjunctival injection, pain, anterior chamber inflammation, you would bend towards the side of an infected. But primarily, we always do err on the side of uh, on the on the side of doubt, giving the benefit of looking at it as an infective lesion and treating as an infective lesion. So your red flag flies high when you are a little scared. You're looking at a patient who's wearing contact lenses and is presenting to you with a click. That's the time if you're not confident, you probably would be happy to send it across or call your, uh, call your specialist to step in to give you expert advice on this. 
Another common feature which you would probably want to look at the ocular surface is the staining patterns which are induced by long-term contact lens wears. Yeah. So these staining patterns are wonderful telltale signs to tell you about the, uh, the sufficiency of, of a particular fit. And these fits do tend to change over a period of time, especially in patients who are using contact lenses for a long period of time. Especially you have a large bracket of corneal ectasia patients who are on contact lens wear. And this is when you're going to look at the staining patterns when you are following them up. And when the staining patterns are particularly in the 3, 6 o'clock or the 9 o'clock or peripheral staining patterns, or if you're having diffuse staining patterns, that's going to tell you how the, the, the fit of the contact lenses has particularly changed. And that's when if you are a, a contact lens practicing specialist as well, or if you're having an optometrist who's aiding you, you probably are going to ask them to step in and look at refitting these patients or modifying these lenses in your subsequent follow-ups here. Contact lens induced dry eye disease is another particular uh, feature here, especially in a setting of an ectasia wearing contact lenses and if there's an association of ocular allergy, that's going to be another red flag where you need to be treating this as well because all these will be risk factors for an onset of infectious keratitis here. Gra Gram-negative infections, acanthamoeba infections, and that said, even gram-positive infections are more common in patients who are in contact lens barrier. So that's another sign which needs to be identified and picked up earlier for prompt management or a referral if you're just a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Then scenario number two is something which we would see commonly is viral conjunctivitis or keratoconjunctivitis here. So it's always a tendency when you're worried in your conjunctivitis stays on for more than a period of three to five days here. And that's when uh, you generally tend to abuse with use of increase in your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or add a low potency ocular surface steroid here. So that's something when you'll have to be cautious. The overview of the steroid abuse or an NSAID abuse here. And again, frequent topical use of fourth generation fluoroquinolones. That's something which commonly everybody resorts to when you see a conjunctivitis. I would simply start with less potent or I wouldn't say less potent, but um, those antibiotics are as simple as chloramphenicol or polymyxin do fun fantastically well when you're talking about viral conjunctivitis or keratoconjunctivitis because it's going to play only a prophylactic role in preventing a secondary bacterial infection here. So overuse or abuse of uh, uh, fourth generation fluoroquinolins, all these will be specific risk factors associated with large epithelial detachments when you're using them over a long period of time. Sometimes you do see viral keratoconjunctivitis depending upon the strain of the organism which is causing whether virulence or the tendency to cause early epithelial detachments is again very high here. So again, this is another scenario which needs to be identified and looked at and, and ask your cornea specialist to step in to help and manage. Otherwise, you would probably be complicating the ocular surface even further in these scenarios. Misdiagnosis is a simple epithelial, uh, con ep simple conjunctivitis or an epithelial keratitis is also another common um, red flag scenario here where you probably have missed the earlier peripheral or small dendritic patterns and you're looking at it only when it's become a geographical ulcer here. So that's a particular warning sign and you would not want to worsen the scenario in such a case here. We now move on to fungal keratitis. I think lots has been said by wonderful presentations which preceded uh, this session here, so I'll just make it brief here. So clinical diagnosis is the key to the management of uh, fungal keratitis. That said, it's refractory or recalcitrant fungal keratitis, where po probably your, uh, your microbiological detection methods is not helping you to enhance your clinical diagnosis. This is a scenario when you probably will have to stop and relook at your management modalities here. So that said, if you do have an access to uh, a confocal microscopy, please do it on early because you need certain clear spaces of the cornea and you need the patient to be more cooperative for you to image better to pick up these fungal hyphae. And when you're able to do that, it is a fantastic uh, methodology and now it's an accepted methodology as an effective alternative to doing microbiological spear and cultures. When you look at those hyphae, then you know that you're dealing with your, uh, your, you have a diagnosis in hand and the morphology, depending upon the resolution and the clarity of your picture, 
also to a reasonable extent with your microbiologist stepping in will be able to tell you if these are fungal hyphae filaments or you're looking at something like Oncardia or some other filaments here. So that's an important uh, clue here where, uh, when you, uh, where you're looking at a, a refractive scenario of fungal keratitis because we know all these atypical scenarios could mimic one or the other and uh, a delay in diagnosis is worsening the morbidity and incre increasing further complications in these diseases here. So you would have nocardial infections, atypical mycobacteria, pythium, microsporidia, all of which can be mimickers to simple superficial or deep mycotic keratitis. And so that's going to be another scenario when your red flag will probably fly higher. Herpetic keratitis, epithelial, dendritic, and geographical is something which I already uh, referred to you about. So beware when your dendritic ulcer is going on into a non-healing geographical ulcer and is having a deeper stromal involvement. That's when you're probably going to be worried of these ulcers. Again, missing necrotizing viral and a misdiagnosis as a bacterial or a fungal stromal keratitis with thinning is a common mistake and overloading the surface with uh, anti antibacterial therapy, you're going to have a higher failure and increased chances of perforation in these cases here. Secondary infections would be particularly high in necrotizing viral, and if you don't pick them on early, again, you are going to have your fingers burnt here. Do not use steroids in a scenario of viral infections of the ocular surface in the presence of an epithelial a break, an epithelial ulceration here. Beware when you have a Hutchins signs positive when you're managing herpes zoster infections and herpes zoster ophthalmicus here. Recurrence is a chance and uh, uh, frequent recurrences, stromal involvements, visual axis pacifications, all will warrant a need for urgent or, or looking at an alternative or enhancing your management modalities or looking at a referral in these cases. Again, misdiagnosis plays a significant role in this as well. Masquerades, recurrent pterygium, especially in elderly individuals, those with very poor ocular surfaces here. Chronic conjunctivitis is another uh, masquerade here which could mimic, uh, which could uh, mask and uh, surface neoplasias here. Recurrent chalazions is another scenario where you probably would miss malignancy of the mimomian gland ducts here. Actinic keratosis and other limbal lesions could be precursors to surface neoplasias here. Moving on to ocular surface disease, dry eye disease, especially in patients who people who are uh, our uh, cataract surgeons here is comprehensive ophthalmologist, then now uh, you probably look at uh, this very nice elucidation of uh, five disease subtypes described by the corneal and external disease refractive society known as the SIDAR signs of ocular surface disease. So I look at the surface to see if you have an aqueous deficiency. It's easy to pick that up and, uh, and it's more worrisome and managing when you're dealing with the associated conditions which affect the lacrimal gland uh, secretions which have uh, dysfunctions or destructions for the lacrimal gland or any other features which will lead to aqueous deficiency. So you're going to be look at, look at this when you're managing your cataract patients here. Goblet cell deficiency, so resulting in mucin deficiency is a, a characteristic feature where you would be finding an evaporative dry eye disease commonly seen in, in scenarios affecting the lid and mammomian gland dysfunction here. Uh, the red flag number three for ocular surface in, uh, in cataract is uh, not that all evaporative dry eye demucent deficiency presents as evaporative dry eye disease, where you do have conjunctival tissue destructions as in, uh, uh, in, uh, in chronic um, in trachoma patients and chemical burns and uh, chronic anti-glaucoma therapies. These again will result in red flag signs here. And uh, poor tear resurfacing and other uh, what are known as co-conspirators were also ones which would be affecting your uh, ocular surface here. So I'll just, uh, the next few slides are just pictorial representations to red flag when you're looking at uh, chronic uh, um, SJS. I think most of this uh, comprehensive ophthalmologists do not want to manage this. So that is something which always lands up in our uh, practice here, so we don't worry. But this is a case which presents as chronic conjunctivitis. When you're looking at diffuse uh, CIN here, it's going to be a very common um, a masquerade or a mimic of chronic conjunctivitis, and you would miss. And this would be very well amenable 
comparable to topical chemotherapeutic agents and you would have wonderful results here. When you look at a chronic poor ocular surface with signs such as telangiectasia here, severe chronic ingestions here, then you're probably looking at cases of a, an acute SGS, a milder onset, and you would not want to miss that. OCPs are very easy to diagnose here, and especially when they come to you and the picture lower down here, but when you're seeing them early on as just chronic conjunctivitis in you involving the phonesis, for, look for phonics, foreshortening, subepithelial uh, uh, fibrosis here, and lid margin uh, ker keratinizations, and the lid margin telangiectasia, which will all be telltale signs, which will raise your red flag. Peripheral uh, dendritic, thick coarse dendritic ulcers in the elderly patients and uh, would be a warning sign to say that uh, these could occur in patients like SLE and do have, uh, uh, do have um, uh, neoplastic, systemic neoplastic diseases here. Again, these are uh, classic pictures when uh, they are uh, uh, a full-blown Stephen Johnson's, usually it's not missed, but when you have a minor SJS, it could commonly get missed by uh, uh, practicing uh, comprehensive ophthalmology. So I'll just conclude with this, that uh, even giving injections of intravitreal, uh, uh, intravitreal avestrins, bevacizumabs, can lead to precipitation of uh, metahepatic ulcerations of the ocular surface. So that's another red flag, considering that intravitreal injections are quite high on here. So that's something you would look at when you're managing the surfaces of diabetic patients here. Thank you again for your patient listening. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that uh, very eloquently put talk and uh, uh, covering very nicely all the very important signs for uh, referral. Uh, Dr. Manisha, would you like to add anything? been uh, described by Dr. Uh, Vanati. And uh, uh, yes, uh, red eye is something, I think, as comprehensive ophthalmologists and even as cornea specialists, which we are dealing uh, uh, very much in our practice. And having these red flags, we should be able to come up to some diagnosis, which will eventually help in managing these patients. So thank you, Dr. Vanati, for such a comprehensive and wonderful presentation as well. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next uh, speaker, my co-moderator, Dr. Purvasha Narang. She is a uh, current associate professor at uh, Ames Nagpur, and uh, she has a keen interest in uh, limbal stem cell transplantation procedures and keratoprosthesis. She will be taking us through two very important aspects of uh, acute chemical injury and SGS and how to tackle them in an acute setting and how to approach. So I'll hand over the stage to Dr. Purvasha. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Somashila Murthy for this uh, kind inv invitation and opportunity to present here, and to AIOC for this DreamCon after a very long time. We are very excited to be back in action. And today I will be taking you through um, the acute ca uh, management in uh, ocular chemical burns where uh, things can actually make a difference. So when we talk about chemical burns, it could actually range from a, a, a wide variety of spectra, like uh, it could be liquids in the form of acids or alkalis, or it even could be due to fumes in lab workers, or it could be holy color injuries or firecracker injuries, uh, tuna burns, lime burns, which are there, cement injuries, and uh, the recent ones like sanitizer burns, or these days, some atypical burns like smartphone battery blasts, which we published, or the cosmetic cream being instilled into the eye, or very recently, uh, the do-it-yourself experimentations on YouTube by kids, which are unsupervised at home, and sometimes the chemicals go into their eyes. These could be one-time insults, or they could be chronic uh, installations in the form of unidentified eye drops, which have been prescribed by quarks. And these uh, can result in extreme injury to the ocular surface, something like this, which a bilateral burn of uh, both the eyes, actually, where there is limbal as well as tarsal ischemia and necrosis. So our management focuses on the acute phase to save the globe, basically to decrease the inflammation and to save the globe. There are various prognostic classifications which are present which help us to manage these cases. And most importantly, when we start our management, this is actually an ophthalmic emergency. And wherever possible, whenever possible, always try to wash, wash, wash or irrigate. 
so in pre hospital settings this could be with tap water or it could be in the hospital settings with whatever uh, fluid that you have uh, there could be ideal solutions also available which can be utilized so the basic aim is to get rid of the offending or the inciting agent and also to debride whatever is impacted in the ocular surface or in the fornices and also along with that we try and assess the epithelial defect to know what the prognosis of the case is and how to manage further so this is the typical emergency kit that i recommend all of us should have in our departments wherein a simple uh, kind of a setup can be there with an iv line uh, there and an open iv line with a fluid there and a topical uh, uh, anesthetic drops along with a desmas retractor the toolkit also includes ph paper to know what is the end point of uh, irrigation and a fluorescein strip so this is a simple tip uh, a kit which can be made accessible and everybody in the department should know how to use it and where it where it is kept so this is just a basic video of trying to show uh, the uh, irrigation in the acute phases always uh, try and assess where the uh, debride where you have to find the impacted material or any tuna particles or any other chemicals which might be impacted there always look into the fornices make the patient comfortable if there is a plaque which is impacted then we have to remove that and that said and done it has to be very uh, aggressive in the beginning itself we have we may have to remove the speculum and inspect the fornice is the the superior as well as the inferior copious irrigation is also continued along with that and then the amniotic membrane depending upon the uh, area of epithelial defect can be placed if it's just a simple uh, corneal epithelial defect with no limbal ischemia then a bcl can be placed otherwise if there is some amount of less than 50% of the bulbar conjunctiva which is again um, implicated then we can place um, amniotic membrane graft if it is more than um, 50% of the conjunctival the, uh, involvement then we can also do an allo slit along with it and if there are uh, primary corneal burns or uh, melts happening then also allo slit can be used and along with that if there is tarsal burn then we might have to resort to mucous membrane grafting so always make sure that the impacted material is removed otherwise there might be later these kind of intrastromal plaques which present which are very difficult to handle so these are the types of uh, the spectrum of injuries to the limbus also and once we've assessed the epithelial defect also we look for the ischemia to get simultaneously and basically we try and assess whichever area is ischemic and here if you see uh, we've debrided the necrotic material and we're trying to rub the area and see if it's bleeding properly if not then we have to do a tenens advancement procedure here we are trying to fashion a conjunctival pedicle flap also to restore the vascularity so any ischemic area that you find needs to have a restored vascular supply this is the tenens advancement and you have to uh, basically suture it and anchor it 1 to 2 mm thick tenon has to be anchored towards the limbus with either 60 vicryl interrupted sutures and then over that we have to place the entire amniotic membrane another case of a child where on touch again uh, with the forceps i'm trying to move the globe does not have any bleeding and so we had to do a 360 degree tenon plasty next we have to look at the exposure which is there and there should be very little threshold for performing and tarsurophy for example in this holy color injury boy where we had performed multiple amniotic membrane grafts along with tarsurophy so basically it decreases the exposure by decreasing the surface area and it starts to bring the tarsal vasculature closer to the surface and it also decreases the lid related keratopathy uh, by decreasing the blink um uh, viper syndrome and that helps in healing of the or the epithelialization of the surface so 5 months later we were able to achieve epithelialization then the most important part becomes your topical steroids which are to control the inflammation and that actually 
basically decides what is the prognosis which is going to happen. So in the first uh, one week to 10 days, it is of prime importance to give topical steroids, sometimes even uh, oral steroids are necessary. And if you feel that there is an area of melt, then we might even apply amniotic membrane graft. And that is how we manage. And the supplementation is along with doxycycline orally, as well as ascorbate. Simultaneously, we also have to mo monitor the intraocular pressure, which might be high because of the direct damage of by the chemical to the trabecular meshwork or by the steroid use. And uh, that might need anti-glaucoma therapy. And sometimes an ominous sign is a hypotony because of anterior segment ischemia, which might later lead to thysis bulbi. So we have to monitor that too. This is a typical post-operative regimen with a topical steroid, which is frequently given, along with preservative-free lubricants, an antibiotic, which is broad spectrum and epithelium friendly, top topical cycloplegics, oral doxycycline, and vitamin C, along with or without anti-glaucoma therapy. So once we have stabilized the surface in the acute phase and the picture looks like this at the bottom, I think that is considered as a success because we have successfully saved the globe. And now the process, uh, the, uh, the patient is ready for the next step of ocular surface reconstruction in the chronic phases and later visual rehabilitation. So I think all of us should strive for a good acute stage management to give a good prognosis to the patient in the later phases. So this is basically uh, our article which had been published for management in the chronic phases. Now I'll just um, quickly take you through the Steven Johnson syndrome uh, patients or the management. Uh, so Steven Johnson syndrome or uh, along with toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is the most severe form of the disease, is basically a spectrum of severe immune-mediated vesiculobullous um, mucocutaneous disease. It might affect the children as well as adults, so we have to be very careful. It is broadly characterized into a acute phase as well as a chronic phase, and both of them have characteristic clinical features, uh, points of presentation, management, and prognosis accordingly. So in the acute phases, you might be asked to be um, treating the patient in the burn ICU or in ICU settings along with uh, dermatologists, and the patient might be in a very morbid condition, whereas in chronic phases, the patient might come by himself or being brought into your OPD for further management. And accordingly, we have to take the necessary actions. So systemically, if you see, the disease might vary from mild rhinorrhea to uh, very severe vesiculobullous um, generalized erythematous disorder with skin sloughing. And in the eye, basically, what you have to see is look for the entire ocular surface, and there might just be a mild conjunctival hyperemia, or there might be entire sloughing of the ocular surface along with lid margin involvement. So um, a basic fluorescein stain can help you diagnose any of these, and you have to also look for pseudomembranes or membranes. So basically, if there is any corneal or conjunctival epithelial def defect along with a lid margin involvement or presence of membranes or pseudomembranes, then we have to be very careful, and that necessitates the uh, procurement or the uh, uh, application of an amniotic membrane graft. And the progress of this disease can be very rapid. Within hours, uh, it can progress from something like this to the total sloughing. So we have to be very careful while monitoring these patients. And a simple amniotic membrane bedside can save the eyes of these patients. So this is the Harvard uh, study group, which says uh, that uh, if there are defects along with uh, pseudomembranes or membranes present, then immediately we have to ap apply the amniotic membrane graft. And this is their technique, which is uh, very useful. So initially, we just anchor the upper part of the um, lid, margin, uh, uh, lid margin to the amniotic membrane graft with uh, these stay sutures, spread the entire amniotic membrane over the surface, and whatever anesthesia the patient can tolerate, we can just start with that. If it's a peribulbar or a facial block or a topical anesthesia, whatever the patient is comfortable with, we have to do this procedure. Then there's a similar front ring which is being made by the infant feeding tube number six, and the inferior part of this is being pushed into the fornix, taking care not to split the amniotic membrane. Then the push, uh, superior part is being pushed into the superior fornix, and then the entire amniotic membrane is again sutured 
taking care to drape the laid margins along with it. So this is a simple, basic amniotic membrane technique. There are variations to this. There are um, these uh, symblephron rings which can be um, uh, layered with the amniotic membrane and simply put into the eye. So a simple procedure like this can help in taking care of long-term complications. So this amniotic membrane can basically uh, help in saving the visual acuity, can help in decreasing the labial stem cell deficiency, the later formation of lid margin keratinization, symblephron, and all these complications later. So this has to be monitored till the patient is in the hospital and even later on. We have to make sure that any uh, membrane or pseudomembrane that was present has to be washed off. There has to be uh, regular saline rinses and topical steroids have to be given in the form of eye drops as well as ointments along with flu frequent lubrication. So that's very important for a uh, lid margin, for lid position, we have to main, uh, ma make sure that there is no exposure because of lag of thalamus because these patients are sometimes in the ICU and their eyes are exposed. So uh, in the chronic phases, around 60% uh, of the patients when they come to us have severe corneal morbidity and then they come to us with chronic secretorization uh, conjunctivitis features and it is very difficult for us to diagnose what was the cause initially. So there, there are a uh, few clues which we can actually utilize and if you see there's a um, posterior migration of the mucocutaneous junction of the lip along with loss of nails and then there is peri uh, ocular and the entire body's pigmentation changes which are present and based on these, this is the loss of finger and toenails and based on, these, based on these, as well as the chronic ocular findings of dystichiasis, meblumin gland orifice blockage, along with lid margin keratinization, there has been a scoring system which can help us diagnose whether this chronic secretization is because of SJS or not. This is important because when we diagnose it as for SJS, the surgical management becomes very important, whereas if it is due to other cases like OCP or MMP, then the medical management in the form of immunosuppression is then the mainstay. So here there is a plaque of lid margin keratinization in all the lids, and this actually causes the lid viper keratopathy and the ocular surface destabilization. So basically, a simple mucous membrane graft over the lid margin can, be, uh, can salvage this eye. Here it's beautifully draped and there's a good anterior edge air position here which saves the eye. And along with this, in this photophobic patient, we had done lid margin keratoplast, uh, keratop uh, lid margin uh, mucous membrane grafting along with a scleral lens placement and this has really improved his presence. Now along with that, there might be a presence of dry eye and in later stages, it might also lead to ocular severe dermalization. So if there's a mild to moderate dry eye, we can do punctal cautery along with autologous serum. And then uh, topical uh, cyclosporin can also be given. And mucus uh, minor salivary gland transplantation can be a method to salvage in certain cases. The ocular surface inflammation is basically taken care of by the systemic immunosuppression with azathioprine or uh, cyclophosphamide in severe cases. Other ways to stabilize the surface, which is melting, could be uh, the application of uh, tissue adhesive along with bandage contact lenses, a gundus and flap. Can we summarize, Purvash? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, comet and sled. So, these are the uh, applications of tissue adhesive. Multiple amniotic membrane grafts, which have been done. This was a case of a tenon patch graft. Uh, uh, the PKs that are done in tectonic, for tectonic purposes do not epithelize well, so we have to monitor those too. And uh, there are issues with the um, surface with the ocular flora. There might be MK, which is present, microbial keratitis. For visual rehabilitation, we might have to have very specific ocular surface procedures before the cataract surgery is done because the view is going to be uh, like this. And the end stay of management is keratoprosthesis. Uh, so this was the case in which we had to do a primary keratoprosthesis after confirming it on a diagnostic endoscopy. And again, we might have epithelization issues. And type 2 K-pros along with uh, modified 
osteodonto keratoprosthesis along with other types of um, ty um, LVPK pros and all might be needed. So all these severe cases can still be salvaged in the acute stage by the simple application of an amniotic membrane graft is what I have found. So um, that was the message that I wanted everybody to take home. Thank you so much. So with this, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Parul Deshpande to the stage. And uh, she's a dynamic cornea surgeon who's been trained at LVP. She's running a solo practice as Sarvode Eye Experts in Mumbai. She's also actively involved in uh, the BOA, Bombay of Thalmic Association activities and uh, she's the executive member and she's also a um, very dynamic uh, ocular surface uh, surgeon as well as she does all the types of lambda keratoplasties. So I invite her for her talk. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Purvasha. That was really excellent. And uh, one cannot overemphasize the importance of accurate management in the acute phase to prevent uh, drastic sequelae in the future. Thank you. So at the outset, I would like to thank AIOS, ARC, Dr. Somashila Murthy for having me here. So without wasting much of time, I would be just going on to the management of uh, dry eye case-based scenarios. Uh, so uh, before we really go to the cases, just a brief review of what DUES2 uh, guidelines are. So most of the cases of dry eyes that we see in our scenarios are usually either the uh, evaporative type of dry eyes or the mixed form of the dry eyes. And very few are usually the aqueous deficient dry eyes. Now these could be asymptomatic, symptomatic with ocular surface signs. So it's, uh, the, when we look at a dry eye disease, it's multifactorial. Uh, many a times uh, we, the patients present with very variable uh, uh, symptoms and signs. So once you have a clinical suspicion and uh, uh, if OSDI score that you have assessed on your clinical history is high, it's uh, mandatory to perform certain diagnostic uh, test in order to uh, uh, assess the uh, uh, presence of dry eyes, the severity of the dry eyes and the type of dry eyes. Uh, some of the diagnostic criteria uh, uh, tests which have been recommended are usually, can you see that? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, the tear breakup time, which could be the non-invasive or a fluorescent uh, uh, tear breakup time, tear osmolarity, and uh, the ocular surface stain, which is a very, very important uh, tool in uh, the diagnosis of dry eyes. Uh, coming to mebography, it's not been uh, recommended as a, a diagnostic tool, but it's one of the important tools which helps us differentiate a uh, mebobian gland disease from the, uh, uh, the um, aqueous deficient dry eyes. So the picture on the left top is a normal uh, mebography and the rest of them show variable amount of the mebobian gland dropout that you see. So normally you do not see the MGD dropout in the age group of less than 20 years. And those about 20 years, you should be only able to see about 25%, which should be considered as normal. But if you see more of it, it's considered to be pathological. Uh, it helps us differentiate between a patient who comes to you with a non-specific symptoms, who could be a normal patient versus a, a patient with dry eyes. Uh, it can differentiate between evaporative and aqueous deficient dry eyes. It usually tends to correlate well with your NIBOT, with your OSDI score, and with your lipid interferometry. And uh, it does not have any predictive value in terms of the therapy. So if you have given some patients some therapeutic uh, uh, treatment and you want to see whether the mebography improves, it really does not. Uh, this is just a small table where I have tried to uh, divide the types of dry eyes. So if you have a tear breakup, which is normal, but you have all the other tests which are positive, like Schirmer's or tear lipid or MGD dropout, it's a subclinical case of dry eyes. And if you have a tear breakup which is affected, with uh, Sharmas, which is affected, you know it's an aqueous deficient. If it is an MGD case, um, uh, you have a lipid which is abnormal or you have a MGD dropout, then it is a uh, evaporative type of dry eyes. And when everything is affected, you know it's a case of severe dry eyes. 
Coming to the treatment, it should be a tear film oriented therapy. So if you have a lipid layer deficient uh, dry eye, you uh, use ointments and you use warm therapy, you use lid compresses and heat therapies which are available in the market. For aqueous defi deficient dry eyes, usually it is the uh, tear lubricants and punctal occlusion. And when you see a mucin deficient dry eyes, something like an OCP, you need to use some uh, mucin secretor gogs like rebapimide. However, it's not available in the market now. And inflammation on the ocular surface needs to be managed with uh, the anti-inflammatory drugs. You need to have a stepwise approach, which has been recommended by uh, the uh, um, uh, DUES2 uh, guidelines. So coming to the cases, this is the case number one, which is a 69-year-old female who was referred uh, for cataract surgery to my practice. Uh, her best corrected vision was 6 by 24. And when you look at the, uh, um, uh, the stained uh, uh, pictures, you can make out that there were diffuse SPKs in both the eyes, the left eye more than the right. She was investigated for uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which turned out to be positive, and was referred to rheumatology clinic uh, for starting her on immunosuppressive. Now, she was on topical uh, uh, CMC and the cyclosporin eye drops, and uh, we continued to review her, and at the end of two months, we still had the patient having persistent SPKs. Her shermers had improved to six millimeter and two millimeter in both the eyes from four and two millim zero millimeter. So at this point of time, when we wanted to visually rehabilitate her, we decided to go ahead with punctal cautery of all punctae. And at one week post-op, you see a dramatic effect. The right eye, the surface clears. The left eye, you just have a few SPKs. Her uh, shermus with anesthesia improves to about 15 and 12 millimeter. So we go ahead with cataract surgery in another week. And uh, we could uh, restore her vision back to 6'6 with a very stable ocular surface. Another patient, 28-year-old female, who comes to you with redness and uh, pricking sensation. She was a known case of rheumatoid arthritis since 2017 and was on uh, immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, when you look at her uh, ocular surface, she had a poor uh, lower tear meniscus. Her stromus test one was three and five, while that with anesthesia was zero millimeter. So this is the uh, dry eye workup which was done. So you can see the infrared picture showing a very low tear meniscus, the ocular surface stain uh, positivity. Uh, this is the mebography, which was normal. This is tear breakup time, so you can see that both eyes were affected, though right eye was more than the left eye. And this is the lipid interferometry, where you can see that the right eye is a totally broken lipid layer. You can't make out a continuous lipid layer. Left eye had some amount of continuous lipid layer. So this patient was put on HPMC eye drops along with CMC gel and cyclosporin eye drops. Her shermers one continue, uh, sl improved slightly, however, that with anesthesia uh, did not improve, and this patient got lost to follow up. This is the third patient who has undergone smile uh, six months back and had a persistent complaints of discomfort on the computer use. So this is her uh, uh, tear evaluation. So you can see that uh, she had uh, Shamu's uh, two values, which were low. And uh, if you look at her mebography, uh, there was a significant amount of gland atrophy. Uh, there were pouting, pouting of the mebovin gland openings with uh, a little viscous uh, uh, lipids coming out. Look at the uh, uh, NIBOT, which was relatively OK, except that the left eye was slightly uh, uh, decreased. and. The tear film lipids, you see a continuous gray film, which probably is either normal or it's uh, a little low. So this patient was diagnosed to have a combination of ADD and MGD. Unlike what we would call it as a neurotrophic cornea having a, a purely um, uh, um, refractive surgery induced dry eyes. And this patient was put on uh, lubricants along with oil-containing ointments with warm compression and lid massage. And at the end of six months, her uh, Shamos 2 values improved to 5 and 8 millimeters. There's another patient who was a long-term contact lens user uh, with uh, symptoms of uh, dry eyes. Um, his uh, uh, lower tear meniscus was good, but if you see the mobile glands, you see a significant am amount of uh, uh, gland dropout on both upper and the lower lids because of the contact lens overuse. This is uh, another patient. So this was an 83-year-old female, uh, right eye asymptomatic, a known case of idiopathic lung fibrosis. In the left eye, she had sudden deterioration of her uh, symptoms uh, 
uh, since few days. And when you look at her, she had a corneal uh, melt with uh, Siddles positive in the central corneal area. So this patient was uh, advised to undergo a tenens patch graft with AMG, which was done immediately. She was put on, uh, she was already on immunosuppressive and a low dose of uh, oral steroids. Her uh, no, oral steroids were stepped up and uh, she was advised to start topical uh, prednisolone eye drops in a tapering dose and uh, her surface improved significantly and at the end of about two years she's having uh, a vision of 6 by 12 in the left eye with a stable ocular surface. This is another patient, a 47 year old female, um, uh, had undergone cataract surgery in the past. A uh, known case of arthritis since 10 years, but was off the treatment. And again, in the left eye, she had uh, sudden uh, uh, deterioration of her symptoms, and the vision was finger counting one meter. And if you see here, the right eye was showing a diffuse SP case, and the left eye was showing a central corneal melt. Though there was no uh, uh, leak, Cedils was negative, there was an uh, irregular anterior chamber. So at this point of time, patient was advised to undergo a tenens patch graft, but she deferred. She was put on oral steroids immediately, along with lubricants and cyclosporine. And uh, within two days, her ocular surface actually stabilized. And uh, at the end of six months, we can see that there is a very good amount of ocular surface stability that we have got. The problem with this patient is compliance. And at the end of six months, she has stopped her cyclosporine. And you can see that the surface is again showing some stain positive areas. Can you see that? OK. So this is my last slide. This is a patient of uh, 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 who came with symptoms in the left eye more than the right eye. And uh, I'm so sorry, this is the same patient. Uh, I'll just skip it. Yeah, so just a last slide of hypersecretory type of Mebowing gland disease. So this patient, if you see the lid margin, it's uh, quite inflamed in the left eye with the posterior migration of your Mebowing glands. Uh, and when you look at the uh, tear breakup time, it's poor in the left eye. And if you look at the lipids, the right eye shows a very good gray continuous layer. The left eye shows a very, very hyper-colored uh, uh, tear lipids. So this is basically a, a thick layer of lipid layer, probably which we see in hyper uh, uh, secretive variant of mebowing gland disease. And one has to actually uh, look at the inflammation as uh, one of the component here and treat that instead of treating it as a pure dry eyes. So conclude, uh, a careful diagnostic evaluation is must. We must include lower tear meniscus, height, tear breakup time, showmers, and possible MGT evaluation in our diagnosis. Stepwise therapeutic approach usually provides a good ocular surface and punctum occlusion in case of non-responsive cases really stabilizes the ocular surface. Surgical management is needed when, uh, when you see a surface breakouts and mebography is definitely helpful in diagnosis of mebowing gland disease which usually would respond to your heat therapy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parul, for those excellently documented uh, cases and videos. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Sharon D'Souza, our next speaker. She's senior consultant at Narayan Netralia, Bangalore, and is also the chief coordinator of the Ocular Surface Clinic there. She'll be talking to us about cases of refractory vernal keratoconjunctivitis. Welcome, Dr. Sharon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just as my slides are being set up, um, I'll start speaking to save some time. So um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to Dr. Somshila Murthy and the entire team uh, at the Dias and at AIOC um, uh, to give me this opportunity to speak. So my topic today is allergic eye disease, and all of us in our OPDs, every day we must be seeing uh, numerous patients who uh, Numerous patients who, who present with various spectra of allergic eye disease, so be it a minor reaching to the severe uh, shield ulcers, and it's not a case or a diagnosis we can escape in any way. Um, and uh, very often they are chronic, they come uh, almost, uh, you know, every week or month, every time they stop the drops, they may have, be having recurrences, and those are the cases that we are trying to um, trying to treat effectively, uh, because we do know that the chronic sequelae of a long-term, a long-standing allergy can be uh, quite severe. So in the interest of time, I don't think we'll have questions in the end. So anybody is having any comment to say? Because we are already running quite late. Okay. 
Right. Yeah, back to you, Sharon. Okay. So as we were saying, there's a very varied presentation and it can be chronic or rec uh, recalcitrant. So a few leading questions to try and differentiate what kind of allergy it is uh, are very, very useful. So you have to see whether the patient has symptoms uh, just a few months of the year or a particular time of the year, which would suggest that it's a seasonal variation. Um, or if it's all through the year. So some people may have it, you know, irrespective of the season or whether it's spring or anything. And that would be a more perennial kind of uh, allergic disease. And uh, depending on how they present, we would need to, in the chronic cases, give them some sort of a prophylactic treatment to try and cover them in case they are seasonal. Now, these are the ones which are, can be quite severe. So VKC or vernal keratoconjunctivitis, by uh, its definition or what we learned during our post-graduation were its children, younger adolescents, more in boys, 11 to 13. But uh, it doesn't often, you know, stick to this. So, so don't restrict yourself to this diagnosis. It can be across a quite a wide range. Uh, they may present to us much later. Um, but what you have to remember is that there are two very strong you know, stark forms, and there may be an overlap there, but a lot of maybe a tarsal form where you have the giant papillae, or a limbal form where you have you know, the horn or trantor spots or just the limbal thickening. So that's very important that we try to remember these pictures, always evert the lids, even if the bulbar surface is looking quite pristine, it's important to evert and check. Another uh, telltale sign is if you stain, and staining is very, very important again in these uh, uh, children or patients, uh, because you can see punctate erosions, and if you, if, even if it's not clinically visible, always stain, look for the punctate erosions, and then evert, uh, because that's the kind of damage that would be forming on the ocular surface. Another very useful thing about staining is that if to look for the activity of disease, so uh, very often if it's an active disease, there would be dot-like staining on the limbal area or on the tip of the Hana Tranta spot, and you know that it's active disease, even if they may not be so symptomatic. Um, the corneal involvement can be permanent, it can cause severe uh, visual impairment, and that's why it's important to try and prevent it or at least reduce the severity of it. Um, so look for this, and if you see a patient who has a panus, has an area which looks like an old limbal stem cell deficiency, keep them on a closer observation. Always ask for a history of atopy. Uh, they may not be aware of it, uh, so you have to ask leading questions sometimes. So asking them just allergies may not help, but you know, dust, sneezing, uh, skin allergies, skin rashes would help these patients. Um, sometimes you may notice it even if they don't tell that they have these kind of eczematous lesions around their eyes, and uh, very often it may be related to some cosmetics that they may use, it may be related to hair dye, so it's important to check for this, look for it, or some chronic medications that they may use. In children, look for this, what is called a Denny Morgan fold, which is just near the corner of the lid, and it's usually because of a chronic rubbing habit that they may have. So look for these telltale signs even if they're not giving the history of it. Now the clinical assessment is, I'm sure, uh, fairly easy and straightforward for most, so I'm not going to go into detail, but it has to be quite intense. One thing with allergy and that I, I would like to stress is that it takes a lot of, especially for the chronic uh, ones, we need a lot of counseling to explain to them that it's not a one-time thing. There would be uh, long-term follow-up and long-term uh, medications required, even if they are doing well. Otherwise, they only come in when there's an exacerbation. That time, we just have to keep giving steroids, and sometimes they may develop a complication of a long-term steroid. The clinical assessment, again, in addition to the ocular assessment, we need to look, especially in the ones who have a chronic disease or have a history of a systemic association, ask them for any skin lesions that they may have. Always check their vision, because they may also have associated problems, especially in children. If they are eye rubbers and you see a significant cylinder, uh, never forget to rule out an early keratoconus. So there may be you know, other conditions that may be associated that we cannot miss on these uh, patients. Now this is an excellent paper and I'm sure it's uh, available to everybody, um, but it really has made our understanding simpler and our management simpler. But um, just the gist of it is that Everything has a stepwise approach, and you may do a step, step up or a step down, depending on which stage you think the patient is coming in, and it's fairly straightforward. Uh, basically, in mild, moderate, moderate, chronic, severe, or blinding disease, your, you know, the way you treat these patients or the aggressiveness with which you treat them would 
change. So the findings are given there, but basically in the early stage, there's not much, there's just a little bit of inflammation and hyperemia, and as you progress, there may be you know, giant papillae or chronic papillae changes on the cornea, including shield ulcers. So what's in our armamentarium, okay? Thankfully, we have quite a bit, but the trick is to know when to use what, and how much of it and how long, how long you need to do it so that you can help them without causing side effects to it. So we remember that um, they, you know, this is like the rough pathway of allergy um, and there's a lot of medications available to us. Uh, in the more severe disease, we would need to use topical steroids. In the chronic or milder disease, we use a lot of mast cell stabilizers and NSAIs we usually avoid. But in addition to this, we do have a lot uh, in addition, the non-steroidal medications have been a lifesaver and I'll come to it. So what you're looking at to consider while planning treatment is the severity of illness and the periodicity of illness. So if it's an in intermediate disease periodicity and the patient has a significant inflammation-free period, then you can titrate your therapy and it would need only the pulse therapy. Whereas if they have a chronic disease periodicity, then in addition to the pulse therapy, you have to keep them on a long-term maintenance therapy. And that's what we'll come to. So again, from the same paper that we talked about, um, it, it sort of tells you what the findings might be. And this is where the treatment algorithm comes in, where we are talking about either a step up or a step down. So usually, if you see a, very, uh, a patient who has a very severe allergic disease at presentation or when you see in the clinic, it is important to hit them hard. So you have to give a high-frequency steroid preferably a stronger steroid, and this we are talking of the more severe. So you see a giant papillate uh, conjunctivitis, you see a lot of uh, horn or tranta spot, limbal inflammation, then the initial treatment has to be strong. A milder steroid may not work, and you want to cut that inflammation. But what would change is how long you use it, so you can keep a very fast taper. Again, if you have a chronic disease, it's important to additionally add on other medications, which would be mast cell stabilizers or non-steroidal medications like cyclosporin or tacrolimus, which have been really invaluable in our practice for these patients. Now, we've already talked about mild disease, and this is where we come into intermediate or chronic disease. So intermediate disease, you give your short pulse of steroid. But in the chronic disease, which we really need to tackle, so a long-term therapy, now, cyclosporin 0.05 and 0.1% is very, very useful in dry eye um, and also in some forms of allergy. But what has really been much more useful is the tacrolimus, uh, which is available to us as 0.03 or 0.1%. Um, and it's, it's much more potent than cyclosporin. It's a one-time dosage usually at night, can be a BD. The only thing you need to remember to tell the patient is that it causes stinging or burning. Otherwise, they would assume that it's a side effect and stop the medication. And usually, you need to give it for at least six weeks to three months uh, because it's a slow-acting medication like cyclosporin. Severe disease, we do not have an option. We have to treat it uh, you know, more aggressively. And as I was saying, we give the steroids and then maintain them. The eversion is at every visit. We do not expect the cobblestone papillae to totally go away. But what happens is that they become less elevated, they become a little more flat topped, that uh, aggressiveness goes away and so they stop abrading the cornea and causing the damage to it. This is just how, so I was saying that cyclosporin 0.05 and 0.1% is uh, very good for dry eye, but for allergy, especially severe allergy, we may need a higher dose and 1% cyclosporin unfortunately is not available to us as a commercial preparation, so you can prepare it. Um, again, fairly easy to do um, and uh, very effective for patients. Only thing they need to keep coming to ask for it. So this is between the comparison between cyclosporin to tacrolimus. Um, tacrolimus is much, much more potent and very easily available in case they cannot tolerate it within the eye, even after using just a rice grain amount, and that's what you tell them, then it can be applied on the skin as well. In case you have a blinding disease, then you really need to monitor them for other complications such as having developed a glaucoma or cataract, and that is very important. So this is a patient who had cobblestone papillae and also a shield ulcer, which is very visible there. Um, we had to do a supratarsal triamcinolone injection, uh, which is, again, doable in the OPD. Um, need a little counseling for these patients, and tri tricot is very um, 
It's not at all expensive to the patient. Uh, the only thing you must remember to check is whether this patient is a steroid responder. So if you've put them on steroids before, you should have monitored the pre pressures. Uh, preferably avoid directly giving a, a times, you know, a supratarsal injection because if the pressure uh, rises up very fast, it's difficult to manage them. Sharon, if we can summarize. Yes. I just want to show this video. So uh, this is how we would deprive the shield ulcer. So fairly easy. You can just do it in a minor OT or in the main OT. And uh, you just have to make sure that you get the entire plaque off and freshen up the edges. Now one thing in addition to all of this is sometimes there is a small group of patients who may in addition require a systemic uh, immunosuppression. So that comes in two forms. One is you send them to the allergy specialist who would um, then do uh, pathogen testing. This is not recommended for everyone, but I have found it invaluable in my practice for those who are recalcitrant to all the things that we've discussed before and keep coming back with uh, recurrent episodes. Uh, and they do sublingual immunotherapy, which ha also is very useful for these patients. So this is the pretty much the algorithm which we can follow. Um, so the IgE, just a point, serum IgE may not always be risen in these patients, um, so blindly doing it and following that may not help, but along with the other tests for recalcitrant patients, it may be very useful. So thank you very much for a patient listening. Thank you so much, Sharon, for the wonderful talk. I now request our co-chairperson, Manisha ma'am, Manish, Dr. Manisha Acharya ma'am, to take us through yeah. the case-based discussion on Demodex infestation which is much more common than we think. Yeah. So uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank the AIOC committee, Dr. Somshila. Uh, it's been a privilege to be part of this uh, session and, I, and we are running a little short of time, so I may go a little faster and you may have to catch up a little faster. And uh, uh, so I'll, I'm, I'll be presenting on uh, Demodex infestation and it's much more common than we all think. Um, basically, uh, what happens, it's a mite. We say, we call it a mighty mite. And sometimes we just miss it and we do not want to. So this 24-year-old gentleman comes to the clinic with and was being treated for VKC of lactanular keratoconjunctivitis since five to six years. Off and on medications, sometimes diagnosed rosacea, not really clear, and vision in the one eye was 6'9", and the other 6'18". And this is the picture how the patient comes with this exacerbation. You can see the edge being a little active. This is the other eye with the 6'9", vision. So one year later, started again on the steroids and the standard treatment for blepharicon conjunctivitis, and uh, you see that it's coming to the center, affecting the vision now a little more. And if you look at the other eye, that again is coming, extending up to the center part. The patient was then started on oral immunosuppressions, thinking that this is a low, more immunological process, and Boston's clear lenses prescribed, which improved the vision of the patients. After 10 months, again, he had this exacerbation. The patient was already on treatment and on uh, mild steroids also. And uh, both the eyes, there was this exacerbation which used to come. This is another young patient who came to us with a one and a half year old history, diagnosed as VKC. Dr. Sharon has very beautifully explained how to treat them and was on treatment. The patient was also treated for viral keratitis, TB MON2 negative, and started uh, steroids, and for which he developed glaucoma as well. So very careful use of non-steroidals. And there was congestion which was there all around with a, uh, prob uh, with a one lesion on the cornea. Again, a young patient who presented, treated for VKC, having this inferior area which was a little more, uh, having a lot of uh, vascularization there in both the eyes presented. So after two years of this presentation, the, uh, you see that the, uh, one of the eyes, it, become, it had this vascularization with an infiltration which was extending up to the center. And there was this small lesion which could be seen. Again, this young patient who presented with the corneal lesion inferior, but with vascularization. So what are the commonalities in all these patients? They were all young patients with chronic presentation and multiple consultations and mixed diagnosis. So what are actually we dealing with? So when you go into the details, one thing sometimes we do forget is looking at the lids. So these are the lids of all these four patients when we really thought that we're not dealing with something like a chronic uh, viral keratitis or a VKC, but something a little beyond that. This was another patient who, who had sudden diminution in left eye since one week. Uh, 
and there was no history of any contact lens use and that inferior in uh, the uh, the lesion was there the patient when the patient came to us he had some sort of diagnosis been made outside of a canthamoeba keratitis on phmb there was history of lasik which was done 7 years back the treating surgeon then saw this lesion got a little panicked and uh, patient was on phmb we did the scrapings when the patient came to us did not show much but we continued on phmb thinking that this was the uh, thing which was coming up but what happened uh the with the treatment the patient seemed to be a little better but when the patient came back one week later looked like better with the treatment which was given and the same treatment continued but 10 days later the again there was increase in the redness and pain so this case if we summarize this was a young male with uh, post lasik with infective keratitis and history of treatment with acanthamoeba we thought there was no growth because we thought maybe we were dealing with uh, the phmb toxicity we spoke to the local doctor did not find much of a conclusive evidence of acanthamoeba there so we stopped phmb the patient started to become better as the diseases were tapered but again came back with this florid inflammation in both the eyes the lids were again bad so what were we dealing with in these patients blepharokeratotic conjunctivitis with recurrent history and a chronic episodes and this is what actually came out to be the result in all of them it was this mite which was there so if you look at it over here it has some projections which are there and it is very easy to diagnose the patient was treated with ivermectin uh, lid scrubs with tea tree oils and that is what we were dealing with and 4 months later the patient did well and is now under follow up with just the lid scrubs being followed this is what actually we call it as a demodex uh, uh, dance and uh, sorry and this is the video of how the mites look under normal microscope you don't need a very high fancy equipment you just need to take out the lashes on the on a slide just put normal saline on a cover slip and this is visible on a a microscope so what actually is this ocular dem uh, demodicosis or blepharoconjunctivitis this is a mite which is there and with two species of follicularum and brevis which is now seen what you basically see very clearly is the cylindrical dandruff and the rate of its direct uh, involvement is pretty high in normal population as well but the action the mechanism where it really have some side effect or the bad effects on the cornea is basically a direct damage which could be follicular distension and hyperplasia or uh, it acts as a vector for bacteria maybe leading to super added infections and giant cell reaction to spe specifically for demodex brevis in the sebaceous glands leading to the blockade and causing much more inflammatory uh, effect on the eye so it manifests it may manifest as lid margin inflammation or a blepharo keratotic conjunct conjunctivitis or a keratotic conjunctivitis with superficial vascularization marginal infiltration and flecten like there so these are the varied presentations which you have seen in all the cases over here of uh, blepharo keratotic conjunctivitis not responding and usually what is common they are young healthy individuals multiple episodes of red eye treated as allergic conjunctivitis and frequent predisposition of a prescription of steroid eye drops so there is these are the red, red flags which should come up when you, when you're not able to take care of this patient as you must have thought i should be and this is what the lids look like so if you look at very details on these lids there is cylindrical dandruff which comes diagnosis is simple by direct microscopy two lashes each half each lid and just label which eye and which lid you are putting and put it on the cover slip and just a saline on the edge and the microbiologist uh, can very easily uh, uh, diagnose the presence of demodex it's it can be there treatment is simple by 50% tea tree oil initially when we were doing this we we had to get it and uh, the tea tree oil from maybe the body shop or some other cosmetic place but now oculeef uh, by the name of oculeef that's a commercially available Uh, uh, preparation which is now used for demodex uh, uh, management ivermectin helps one week apart 200 micrograms per kg it's a, it's a 12 mg tablet which is there and just cleaning is fine but maintaining personal hygiene discard use facial makeups washing bedding and pillow and treatment of the spouse is something which is recommended when you are dealing with um, these demodicosis 
Uh, I would just like briefly touch upon that viral keratitis sometimes is said to have a uh, preponderance for uh, demodicosis and this may lead to more recurrence. This is one of the studies which definitely tells us about the potential role in ocular demodicosis in patients with concomitant refractory uh, herpetic keratitis and this is something we are also at our institute working on and looking at very details of these studies. And sometimes you have these recurrences and also associated demodex keratitis. This is our public series of 14 patients with history of chronic red eyes and corneal involvement and they all were diagnosed as demodicosis and treated with tea tree oil and oral ivermectin. This is another uh, paper from our institute. So I would just say that ocular demodicosis is an underdiagnosed condition and should be kept when we are dealing with chronic red eyes. So please, I mean, I find it very simple, but it is much more there than we are seeing. And we are just trying to take care of the symptomatic uh, patient at that point and it comes back. So unless you're taking care of the underlying pathology, it's bound to come back and sometimes may become blinding to the patient. So thank you so much. I would like to acknowledge our department, especially Dr. Mathur, Dr. Neha, Dr. Nikunj. I have borrowed some cases from them as well. And the lab services who have been the backbone for treating these patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, and thank you all. I think we will now move on to the next session. In the interest of time, we would not take any questions right now, but perhaps we can discuss out later at the end of this session. Thank you again. I request Swapnil and uh, Aditya to come over for the next session.